snow. Kyle, Betsy Cavalier, and I hurried toward the front door. We had our guns drawn. The house was deadly quiet from the outside. Somewhere in the neighborhood, a dog howled. I go in first, I said to Kyle. I wasn't asking his permission. Kyle chose not to argue with me. The door of the house was unlocked. They had left it open. On purpose? Or because they departed in a hurry? I moved inside, quickly, silently. The foyer, living room, and kitchen were all dark. Agent Cavalier motioned for the three of us to split off. There wasn't so much as a whisper inside the house. I moved in a low crouch toward the kitchen. I took a look inside. No one there. I opened a wooden door at the rear of the kitchen. Closet. The pungent odor of spices and condiments. I opened a second door. Back stairs, leading up to the second floor. A third door. Stairs leading down to the cellar. The cellar had to be checked out. I flicked on the light switch. No light came on. Police, I yelled out. No answer. I took a deep breath. I hesitated a second or two, then stepped on creaking wooden stairs. Police, I repeated. Still no answer from down there. I flicked on my maglite flashlight. My heart was beating wildly as I hurried down the flight of stairs. My gun was at the ready. I lowered my head and took a good look around. Jesus. I saw them as soon as I cleared the wooden overhang. I'm Detective Cross. I'm the police. The wife and the baby girl were there. The mother was bound and gagged with black tape over different colored cloths. Her eyes were wide and as bright as searchlights. The baby had black tape over her mouth. The infant's chest was heaving with silent sobs. They were alive, though. No one had been hurt, either here or at the bank. Why was that? The pattern had changed. The Mastermind. What a quaint, totally absurd name. It was almost perverse. He liked it for just that reason. He actually watched the scene at the bank manager's house, and he felt as if he were standing outside of his own body. He remembered an old TV show from his youth, You Are There. He was, wasn't he? He found it quite thrilling to see the FBI technicians enter the house with their black magic boxes. He knew all about them, the VCU, or Violent Crime Unit. He closely observed the somber, serious-faced agents come and go. Then the Rosslyn police arrived en masse. Half a dozen squad cars with their turret lights blazing. Sort of pretty. Finally, he saw Detective Alex Cross leave the house. Cross was tall and well-built. He was in his early forties, resembled the fighter Muhammad Ali at his best. Cross's face wasn't flat, though. His brown eyes sparkled constantly. He was better looking, actually, than Ali had ever been. Cross was one of his prime opponents, and this was a fight to the death, wasn't it? It was an intensive battle of wits, but even more than that, a battle of wills. The mastermind was confident that he would win against Cross. If anything, this was a mismatch. The mastermind always won, didn't he? And yet he felt a little unsure. Cross exuded confidence, too, and that made him angry. How dare he? Who did the detective think he was? He watched the house for a while longer and knew it was perfectly safe for him to be there. Perfectly safe. On a numerical scale of 9.9999 out of 10. He had a crazy thought then, and he knew where it came from. When he was just a boy, he absolutely loved cowboy and Indian movies and TV shows. He always rooted for the Indians. And he particularly loved one extraordinary trick that they had. They would sneak into an enemy's camp and simply touch the enemy while he slept. It was called, he believed, Counting Coup. The mastermind wanted to count Alex Cross's coup. As soon as we knew that everyone in the house was safe, 
I called St. Anthony's Hospital to check on Jenny. I was put in contact with the nurse's station on Jenny's floor. I spoke to an RN, Julietta Newton, who sometimes stopped by Jenny's room when I came to visit. This is Alex Cross. I'm sorry to bother you, Julietta, but I'm trying to reach my grandmother, or my daughter, Jenny. Nana isn't on the floor at the moment, the nurse told me. Jenny just went down for an MRI. A spot opened up, and Dr. Petito wanted her to take it. Your grandmother accompanied her downstairs. Is Jenny all right? The nurse hesitated. Then she spoke. She had another seizure, Detective. She stabilized, though. I rushed back to the hospital from Rosalind. I got there in about fifteen minutes. I hurried down to B1 and found an area marked Diagnostic Testing. It was late, almost ten o'clock. No one was at the front desk, so I walked right past and down a light blue corridor that looked eerie and foreboding at that time of night. As I approached a room with computerized tomography and MRI lettered on the door, a technician appeared from the doorway across the hall. Can I help you, sir? I'm Jenny Cross's father. She's having an MRI. She had a seizure tonight. The man nodded. She's down here. I'll show you the way. The hospital tech showed me into the MRI room where Nana was sitting vigil. I looked over at the MRI machine, and it was state-of-the-art. It was more open and less restraining than others I'd seen. I had two MRIs, so I knew the drill. Jenny would be lying flat inside. Her head would be immobilized on either side by sandbags. The image of Jenny alone inside the imposing machine was disturbing. Can she hear us? I asked. Nana cupped her hands to her ears. She's listening to music in there. But you can hold her hand, Alex. She knows your touch. I reached out and took one of Jenny's hands. I squeezed gently. She squeezed back. She knew it was me. What happened while I was gone, I asked Nana. We were lucky, so lucky, she said. Dr. Petito stopped by on his rounds. He was talking to Jenny when she had another grandma. He ordered the MRI, and they had an opening for her. Actually, they stayed open for her. I sat down because I needed to. Don't start blaming yourself, Nana told me. Like I said, we're very lucky. The best doctor in the hospital was right there in her room. I'm not blaming anybody, I muttered, knowing it wasn't true. Nana frowned. If you had been there during the seizure, she'd still be here having the MRI. And in case you think it could have been the boxing, Dr. Petito said... There's almost no chance. The contact was too minimal. It's something else, Alex. That was exactly what I was afraid of. We waited for the test to be over. Finally, Jenny slowly slid out of the machine. Her little face brightened when she saw me. I bent down to kiss her. How are you, sweetie? I asked. You feeling okay now? I'm hanging in there. Hanging tough. I can't wait to see the pictures of my brain. Neither could I. Dr. Petito had waited around for the pictures. He never seemed to leave the hospital. I met with him in his office at a little past 11.30. I was beyond tired. What did you find? Is she all right? He shook his head slowly. I'm afraid there's a tumor. I'm pretty certain that it's a pilocytic astrocytoma, a kind of tumor that strikes the very young. We'll confirm that after the surgery. It's located in her cerebellum. The tumor is large, and it's life-threatening. I'm sorry to have to give you that news. I spent another night at the hospital with Jenny. The mastermind couldn't sleep. Too many unwelcome thoughts were buzzing around like a swarm of angry wasps invading his already overwrought brain. The mastermind finally rose up from bed. He sat slumped over his desk, waiting for the waves of nausea to pass, waiting for his goddamn hands to stop trembling. This is my pitiful life, he thought. I despise it. I despise everything about it. Finally, he began to write the hate mail that had been on his mind as he lay in bed. Attention of the chairman, Citibank. This is a wake-up call, and it's serious. The consequences to Citibank are dire. You think that you're safe from the little people, but you're not safe. My hand is shaking as I write this. 
My whole body trembles with outrage. My banker is asleep at the switch. For a personal banker, she is about as impersonal as one of the gray partitions in her cubicle office. I had always thought bankers were smart and buttoned up. How is it possible, then, that on numerous occasions I have had annoying, insane, egregious errors made on my account? I requested a simple transfer of money between funds, IMMA to checking. It didn't get done in a timely manner. When I recently moved, my change of address was not handled properly. Three months have passed, and I still haven't received any of my statements. It turns out the address was never changed, and my statements are going to the wrong address. After all of these insults, after all of these mistakes by your busy doing-nothing employees, your bank has the nerve, the gall, to deny me a personal loan. The most intolerable part is to have to sit there and listen to little Miss Princeton Priss turning me down with insincerity and condescension dripping in her voice. I judge service organizations on a ten scale. I expect 9.9999 out of 10. Your bank fails miserably. The little people will have their day. He reread the letter and thought it wasn't too bad, not for two something in the morning. No, actually, the letter was good. He would do an edit, then sign, and finally deposit it in his file cabinet, as he did with all the other letters. They were far too dangerous and incriminating to actually send through the federal mail system. Jenny and I were both awake around five the next morning. Her room looked out on an expansive sunroof and small flowering garden. We sat quietly and watched the sunrise through the window. We held hands and stared at the glorious orangish-red sun. Jenny was very quiet. Dr. Petito walked into Jenny's room. You're number one on our list, he told her and smiled. And they took Jenny away from me for surgery. I held a special image in my mind of Jenny dancing with Rosie the Cat singing Ring Around the Rosie. I let it play over and over again that long, terrible morning at St. Anthony's. Nana, Damon, and I didn't talk much that whole time. Samson and Jenny's aunts came by for short stints. They were devastated, too. It was just awful. At a few minutes past five, the neurologist, Dr. Petito, walked into the waiting room where we were gathered. He was smiling. We got it, Dr. Petito said, as soon as he reached us. He shook my hand. Congratulations. Thank you, I whispered as I held his hand tightly, for all your sacrifices. Two days later, I returned to the robbery murders, a case that both fascinated and repulsed me. I saw Betsy Cavalier at the FBI office on 4th Street. She wagged her finger at me, but she also smiled in a friendly way. She had on a tan blazer, blue t-shirt, jeans, and she looked good. I was glad to see her. That first smile of hers seemed to finally break the ice between us. You should have told me about your little girl, the apparition. Everything okay, Alex? The doctor said he got it all. She's a tough little girl. This morning she asked me when we could start our boxing lessons again. I'm sorry I didn't tell you before. I wasn't myself. She waved off my last few words. I'm just happy your daughter is fine. I can see the relief on your face. I smiled. Well, I can feel it. It brought lots of things into focus for me. Let's go to work. I sat down at the desk I was using and started to look through the mountain of paperwork that had already accumulated. Agent Cavalier was at the desk across from mine. I was glad to be back on the line. One or more killers were out there murdering bank tellers, managers, families. I wanted to help stop it if I could. An hour or so later, I looked up and saw Agent Cavalier staring my way with a blank look on her face. She'd been lost in her thoughts, I suppose. There's someone I need to see, I said, 
I should have thought of him before today. He left Washington for a while. 